So thanks very much for that introduction. I'm very happy and excited to be here. Um, not just because it is a beautiful day in South Carolina, but uh, also because of the wonderful sector that's um, been built and being built here and getting a chance to meet with some of the folks today. It's been really very inspiring, so happy to be talking to y'all. So I'm going to be talking today about um, network correlates of aphasia recovery. Um, and so um, this is my lab, Libra lab uh, at Louisiana State University, where we're continuing to do some work with aphasia. So we're going to start talking about the impact of aphasia. And I understand that you know, it's probably kind of preaching to the choir here, um, but it's a good place to start anyway. And then we'll talk about the, the therapy and the study that this, these data came out of. And then I'll talk a little bit of an intro to brain connectivity in general and in aphasia. And then the results of two separate but interrelated studies on uh, dynamic functional network connectivity and network modularity, and then we'll just wrap up. So to start with the impact of aphasia, um, aphasia affects, it's now estimated by the National Aphasia Association, two million or more Americans. And uh, this is a third of stroke survivors at some point during the recovery process. This is usually acute. In more chronic stages, it's down to you know, maybe a fifth. Uh, but this is huge in terms of not just, of course, the personal effects uh, to individuals with aphasia or the people in their families and social spheres who are affected, but also in terms of the cost um, to us uh, economically as well as socially. So these are estimated stroke costs in the US. So we were at um, $72 billion in 2010. It's estimated that by 2030, we'll be up to $183 billion. And that by 2050, given the aging of the population, uh, given our better ability to intervene in strokes, so we have less mortality, that we're going to have $2.2 trillion um, cost in stroke. And this is huge as far as the impact on our economy, but also the impact on the quality of life uh, for people with aphasia. So there was a study done, granted this was in a, a long-term care facility, um, but where individuals in the facility were uh, asked about quality of life, and it was found actually that aphasia had a greater negative impact on their quality of life than either cancer or Alzheimer's disease in this cohort. So we're talking about really um, very significant uh, effects. And most people still aren't familiar with aphasia outside of perhaps this lecture series, outside of knowing someone with aphasia. Um, but you know, there are a lot of famous people who've had aphasia or who have aphasia. So Kurt Douglas, was, um, who was famously known as Spartacus, um, had aphasia following a stroke. Um, Bo Biden, the son of, uh, of course, former Vice President Joe Biden, um, had aphasia due to a brain tumor. Uh, Gabby Giffords, we're probably all familiar with, who had aphasia secondary to a gunshot injury to the, the head, um, and has since become a very outspoken um, defender of, um, uh, proponent of uh, um, gun control. And uh, you might be familiar for, with the Netflix original film on, uh, on Netflix, my Beautiful Broken Brain, uh, which follows the story of Lokia Sutherland, who had uh, aphasia due to a hemorrhagic stroke. But despite all of this uh, aphasia in the, uh, in the community at large, uh, we still have a lot of work to do, and this is where I'll sort of just editorialize for a moment, we have a lot of work to do in terms of advancing aphasia awareness, because we still have in the National Aphasia Association survey, only it was less than 9% of uh, Americans had actually heard of aphasia. 30-something um, percent, 33 percent, about a third of Americans had uh, heard of aphasia um, and equated, sorry, less than 9% had heard of aphasia. 33 percent equated uh, language disorders or communication deficits with intellectual issues. Um, so that's really significant. And most of the people who had heard of aphasia, it was because they knew someone who had aphasia. Uh, so that's just sort of my editorializing that we need to uh, still do some work even outside of this lecture series and beyond our research on trying to build uh, aphasia awareness in the greater community. So now I'm going to describe the therapy that was done uh, that provided the data for, uh, uh, for the network analyses I'll be talking about. 
So the participants were individuals who had chronic aphasia, so more than six months post, but at least when they started the intervention. Uh, all of them had a single left hemisphere ischemic stroke, four of them were female. Um, okay, the ages, it was a variety of ages from 31 to 72, variety of time post, five at, this is at recruitment, but six by the time they started the therapy. Um, to over 10 years post, lesion size ranging from 1 to 26% of the left hemisphere. And so this is a lesion overlap showing uh, the areas that are colored. You can see that, of course, the areas that are colored um, would be where at least two people had lesions. And so we see that they're surrounding this perisylvian area, which is what we typically see. And we have a variety of classifications of aphasia. So you know, make brocus conduction, transcortical motor, transcortical sensory, and brachy, so fluent and non-fluent aphasia. And this is sort of representative of what we often see in stroke studies unless we control it very closely, in which case we risk not being able to recruit adequate numbers of people. Um, that we have a lot of heterogeneity in the uh, subject pool and then consequently it becomes hard to uh, explain some of our heterogeneity in terms of results. The therapy was an imitation-based therapy, so people were actually just hearing words and, um, and phrases or sentences and then were repeating them. And this was provided on a computer program that was on a dedicated laptop that they were lent for the duration of therapy. And this was important in order to achieve the intensive therapy program. Uh, so people did three sessions a day, each of 30 minutes, and they did this six days a week for six weeks. So this was important because intensity of therapy is probably the one feature that we can say is strongly correlated with the therapy outcomes. Um, so far, we're working on it. The outcome measure for this particular, um, for these data that I'll be showing, uh, is narrative production, so more of a naturalistic, kind of ecologically valid, I'd argue, uh, discourse measure. And it might seem strange to think of repeating words and phrases as contributing to improvement in narrative production, but there was a biological motivation for this. So some of you, all of you in this room certainly are probably familiar with mirror neurons, uh, which were identified in the macaque monkey. And so these are neurons which uh, were initially found in motor areas, which were active both for observing someone performing a, a function, an action, a motor action, initially can and also for performing the same action. And of course, we don't do that kind of invasive measurement um, in humans, or at least in healthy humans. So we have, however, seen that there are mirror properties, we could call them networks within the brain that are active for both the observation and execution of motor tasks, including hand motor tasks, but also including mouth motor tasks, such as speech. Um, and so, it might seem strange to think of re repeating unrelated words and phrases uh, contributing to a narrative production, it's a different task, uh, but the theory is that we were activating this frontoparietal circuit by having people observe, and then as it became strengthened through the observation, the individuals became better able to um, harness it and produce uh, speech. So this is an example <coughs> of a therapy saha. Uh, therapist in those? Hang in there. So this is kind of what they saw, various words and phrases, and then the person's uh, job would be to repeat back whatever word or phrase they heard. The experimental design, so it was six weeks of therapy, as I mentioned, but it was actually an 18-week study. So people were, um, had both behavioral and imaging over the course of 18 weeks. So. There were six weeks of pre-therapy period, so a baseline period, six weeks of therapy, and then six weeks of a post-therapy maintenance interval. And over the course of this time, there were four behavioral assessments, so six weeks before therapy, immediately before therapy, immediately after therapy, and six weeks after therapy, and also seven neuroimaging sessions. Um, so spaced every three weeks over that 18-week interval, and so there were three pre-therapy and three post-therapy sessions. The narrative task, on which I'll be talking about the outcome measures for, was production of the Cinderella story. So, of course, this you know popular fairy tale that most of us have grown up with. And um, we analyzed the, 
the, the transcripts for, to look at the number and the percent of correct information units that people produce pre versus post therapy. And so words were counted as being correct information units if they were novel, so they couldn't just be repeating the same word over and over again, um, if they were appropriate for the story of Cinderella, and if they were intelligible. And over the course of therapy, we found a mean change of uh, about 34 correct information units more that people produced after therapy compared to before therapy, which uh, amounted to about uh, 4%. And there was a lot of variability in terms of you know, uh, who improved and who didn't um, for both of those measures. And they, those were both significant, however, even given the variability, uh, so those are the key values. And this effect size is you know, small to moderate effect size um, for both of these measures. And importantly, there was no difference between the two pre-therapy time points that were six weeks apart, or the two post-therapy time points that were also six weeks apart. So we can be pretty confident that the changes that we did see over that six weeks of therapy was due to the therapy and not just due to you know, some random fluctuations. And when we looked at the uh, demographic kind of variables to see what was associated with this improvement, what we saw that uh, if we looked at number of variables that can inform improvement, such as age, time post onset, um, lesion size, um, fluent versus non-fluent aphasia, their baseline performance on the task, what we found was that the one, um, the one variable that correlated with how much they improved on this task was the number of therapy sessions they completed. Um, so the more therapy that they did, and we were able to monitor them because they were doing therapy on that laptop and we were recording them as they did each therapy session so we could see how many therapy sessions they had done. Uh, but this was the only of those variables that uh, correlated with their improvement. Uh, so in summary, on the, based on this narrative task, it seems like imitation therapy might offer some kind of unique benefit that's beyond the therapy task or content. We didn't have them repeating words or phrases that were like, you know, pumpkin, going to the ball, right, that were associated with Cinderella. They were just repeating words and phrases that were chosen on a number of criteria, but including that they would be functional in daily life. So it seems like there's some measure of generalization here, which as we know, if we work with it, aphasia is a notoriously difficult um, thing to be able to realize. And so, uh, this is kind of consistent with the results of Fridrikson et al. in 2012 uh, for speech entrainment, which is kind of like an online imitation task where they also found generalization to untrained uh, items, untrained scripts. In these results, it seems like more therapy led to better results, uh, but of course we have to be cautious and wonder whether there was a third variable. Uh, it didn't seem like people just kind of got bored with the therapy and then tapered off. Um, so we don't think that that was the issue in terms of their amount of improvement, but it's completely possible that another variable like attention might have contributed to their ability to produce, to complete more sessions and also to their ability to benefit from uh, the therapy itself. But in general, this offers support for our fundamental hypothesis that we are engaging this observation execution network and able to, so somehow by having them observe and produce this speech, they were able to then better independently, spontaneously, in the confines of this task, produce speech at that time also. Okay, so now we're going to move on to talk about brain connectivity in aphasia, just a brief introduction. So since we've been doing neuroimaging, um, we've been looking at various language uh, activations. So these are some early images from PET, um, where we can see that there are different uh, regions that are activated for different language related tasks. And uh, this is demonstrating that between, between controls on the top line and uh, people with aphasia on the, in the bottom row, that there are differences in activation. Um, so the data for the individuals with aphasia is only showing the right hemisphere. This is neurological convention. Um, so right is left, left is right. Uh, but we can see that there's a lot more activation in the right hemisphere um, compared to a healthy control. And this is probably not surprising, seeing as that left hemisphere has a probably fairly large cortical lesion. This is during a reading task. But we can see that there's a lot more activation in the individual with aphasia 
um, performing the same task as the healthy controls. And we're not looking at activation solely here, we're looking at brain connectivity. And so I just want to point out that this is, we're talking about statistical dependencies in the time series, not the anatomical connection. So people think of connectivity, they think of connections, they think of white matter, such as you see here, um, which can also be visualized with diffusion tensor imaging. Um, but in this case, we're talking about functional connectivity, so the correlations in activation among various regions. So if the unit of neuroimaging is a voxel, right, then we could have two voxels here, a red voxel and a blue voxel. And we can see that as, they're, as we're traveling through time that we have relative correlation among these two voxels if this was their time series, right? And so that's what we're looking at in this context. And rather than using a task, we're using resting state fMRI. So in a task, um, well, let me just back up to resting state fMRI has been investigated a lot in healthy controls um, and it's being looked at more and more in dementia and motor stroke. Um, it hasn't been looked at as much in aphasia, although this is increasing a lot in recent years, uh, but there are big advantages for a population with aphasia. So there's no explicit task to perform, right? We don't have to be concerned of the individual um, you know, necessarily understood maybe nuances of a fairly complex task. Um, we don't have to worry about issues like of working memory and attention that can often be impaired in aphasia, even though it's not a cognitive disorder, but we can still see those cognitively related skills being impacted. We don't have to worry about motor cortex activation uh, or the possibility that there might be motor issues that are then confounding uh, our analyses because, of course, it's possible to have motor issues accompanying uh, particularly non-fluent aphasias. And also, uh, it may reduce motion to not have people doing any concurrent task, which is an issue in working with individuals with stroke in general. There, there tends to be motion. So I understand that you all do quite well with packing the head in, so I have to ask more about that. Um, and then what we see when we analyze these data is that we can uncover these anatomically distinct regions that uh, are correlated in time and we believe them to be functionally linked. So in healthy controls, um, you might see patterns like this, where you see, as this goes through the video, we can see regions that are becoming red at the same time, or then, and then those start to fade. And we can see other regions becoming um, more blue, right? But what those colors are signifying is uh, a functional connectivity in a correlation in the time series. Okay. And when we analyze those data and we look to see, uh, we did this with a, an independent component analysis. I'll show the data for our, pay, our clients on the next slide, our participants. Um, but there are various ways to decompose that signal. Um, we used independent component analysis. Uh, this is using a fuzzy clustering. But we end up seeing these networks, again, which might be anatomically separate, but uh, show up um, as being correlated. And so some of these, you can see here, um, these strong a visual network. <coughs> Right, we can see um, this probably the most famous is this uh, default mode network. You can see this frontal sort of executive network. And so these are, these are networks that, um, again, functionally correlated in time that show up across various kinds of analyses of resting state networks, um, of resting state fMRI. And in our participants who had stroke, you can see here that this, that lesion overlap again um, in the, the colors getting from cooler to hotter, depending on how many individuals were lesioned at that voxel. Uh, and the resting state networks are demonstrated here in the magenta. And we can again see uh, a default mode network. We can see this frontal executive network. Um, we can again see a vision network. Um, various uh, left and right frontoparietal networks, somatom, uh, uh, sensory motor network, and as you'll see, they're all they all tend to be um, lateralized to the right side. Again, this is uh, 
radiological convention, so left is right, uh, which is not surprising as these people have large uh, cortical strokes on the, in the, the left hemisphere. So now these resting state networks that we identified are the basis for the next two segments, which are about the two studies that have been done, um, looking at dynamic functional network connectivity and also network modularity and seeing how these networks correlate with uh, aphasia recovery. So dynamic functional network connectivity um, is a way at looking at these networks not just as static over the course of the entire um, resting state interval. We used five minutes. Um, some people use longer periods of time. Um, so instead of looking just across the five minutes, we looked at isolated um, windows, actually a sliding window. So we looked at the first 30 seconds and then we moved along our interval, which is a TR of 1.5 seconds, looked at the next 30 seconds, moved along, look at the next 30 seconds. And within each of those windows, we looked at um, how those resting state networks, how correlated they were with each other. So they each had, so those networks are defined by their, um, how correlated they are uh, within each other. That's how they're defined. But now we're looking at for each of those networks as we, if we separate them, what kind of time series do they have related to each other? So we're able to identify correlations between how, um, between the connectivity of those networks. Does that make sense? Everyone? Okay. And so we had basically a connection matrix for how well correlated those networks were with each other for each of these windows. So for each 30 seconds, we had maybe a high correlation between the default mode network and the sensory motor network, um, right, across the, um, we identified eight networks, as I just showed, that were uh, um, non-artifactual in our independent component analysis. And so then with those, that group of windows, and so we end up with like 184-ish windows um, for each of these five-minute scans, we could say how, um, and so we ended up with that for each scan. And remember that these individuals were scanned up to seven times and included in this analysis were 12 people whose um, data were good enough to use, who we had enough data to use. And so we identified then an enormous number of these windows, so 184 times 12 times seven, so thousands of windows. And we were able to cluster those into a smaller number of states. So we selected 10 as our number of states to identify, which was based on the number of states that explained uh, an, an adequate amount of more variance than did 11, right? So then the next number did. Uh, so those 10 states um, were characterized by how the correlations were um, among those resting state networks. And so we identified, as I mentioned, 10 states. So here are nine of them. Um, so you can see that there is, and this is, so each uh, resting state, uh -huh, each resting state network is uh, along, identified along the diagonal. So we can see this state, for example, that the default mode network is anti-correlated, negatively correlated with everything else, which makes sense, right? Because it's the task negative network. So we would sort of expect that you might see a state in which it's not correlated with all of the other networks. And then there are various other, um, so these various other states represent the relative balance, the correlation among these resting state networks. And if I had been asked to theorize in advance what um, network might be correlated with recovery, I'm not sure what it would have looked like. But we did identify one, it was state 10. I haven't showed it yet. And in state 10, uh, so along the y-axis of each of these plots is the change in the number of correct information units that people produced. Along the x-axis is the change in the amount of time that they spent in this state 10, in which so this relative balance among their resting state networks, the relative correlation among these resting state networks. And so you can see that as people spent more time, so more of those windows, those 30 second windows in state 10, the more time that they spent in, the, in state 10, the better that they performed on 
this uh, correct information unit task, the more correct information units they produce during the Cinderella story. So you can see that this was the case um, if we looked at just pre versus post measures, and also if we separated, separated it out to look at the period immediately post-therapy versus pre-therapy, or the 12-week um, point, so that this is following the maintenance interval compared to pre-therapy. And even though we only had eight subjects left, if we looked at the maintenance interval because of the number who missed the immediately post or the six weeks post therapy scan, we still saw a very strong correlation um, between spending more time in this state and performing better on that uh, and performing better on that task. So this plot, for example, shows this is what happened after therapy went away. Right? So they weren't getting therapy anymore, but if they continued to spend more time in this state, they continued to get better. And if they ended up spending less time in this state, they, um, they um, lost some performance. So if I'd had to guess what this state might have looked like that would be correlated with their improvement and continued improvement on this task, I, mean, I probably would have guessed something like, the language network would be positively correlated with the, you know, maybe sensory motor network to support speech production or maybe an attention network. But actually what this state 10 looked like was a state of essentially zero correlation. So the highest correlation here is uh, uh, 0.13. Um, and so all of the states are basically doing their own thing. They're not actually functionally co correlated. They're not anti-correlated. Um, they're doing their own whatever it is they're doing. They have their own independent kind of time series. And so this is a completely data-driven analysis, right? So I didn't go in. I mean, I went in here agnostic, and this, this is what the data this is what the data showed. So interpreting it, um, I thought that this showed uh, evidence for increased improvement uh, of on this task with increased functional independence on these resting state networks, right? So their time series are becoming more independent, they're becoming less correlated, and we're seeing that this somehow supports uh, improvement on this task. Uh, I think it's driven by the ability to um, isolate these networks in order to be able to support performance on this task. And it's actually consistent with findings, uh, although I was surprised to see it at the time, it is consistent with findings that we see um, for more focal and more efficient activation. We see it in expert compared to novice motor control. So for example, these data, we see two images here. One is, um, this is actually during a, setting up a fake golf shot in the scanner. People would do a little finger proxy swing. Uh, and on the top row, we see a novice person trying to set up how they would take their golf shot. And in on the bottom, we see uh, this very focal, precise activation, which is from an expert golfer performing the same task. This is also consistent with the patterns that we see in stroke recovery for both motor and language that we see uh, typically after stroke, we see a lot of activation everywhere. And then we see a return to more, as people improve, we see a return to uh, less activation, more left lateral, lateralized activation. It's also apparently consistent with what we see in second language acquisition, that as people become more proficient in a second language, we end up with more efficient activation patterns. Um, so uh, I thought that this was consistent, um, but I wanted to explore this further um, and see whether my hypothesis about these segregated networks um, could stand up to another analysis. So that's what led to this network modularity analysis. So this modularity analysis uh, used a graph theoretical approach. Um, graph theory is the study of pairwise relationships um, among different units, which we call nodes, uh, and then the connections between them we call edges. But it's basically a way of characterizing um, a complex network structure in sort of a simple way because we're just we've got this complex networks with many pieces and many connections and we're just going to analyze it by looking at all of the different pairs and the relationships and then we can have summary measures across that so this is an example of something that you can do with um, your email if you're so inclined 
I think it's a tool out of MIT. If you want to give them your email and your password, they will characterize your social networks. This is not my, <laughs> not my email. Um, but you can see in this that all of the uh, circles or nodes are individuals who one has emailed with. And all of the connections are showing emails that have included like some sort of CC or some other connection with another individual. And there are larger circles demonstrating people who there have been more emails with and smaller circles. So there's different ways of weighting the nodes. There are also different ways of weighting the edges. Uh, and this is another <laughs> example of how uh, um, we can think of a complex graph. So here I came from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm up here in Columbia, South Carolina. And um, we can see that this is a complex network of all the different airline connections. And I had to fly um, through a, a hub in order to get here, right? And we're familiar with airports that are hubs, so I flew through uh, Atlanta. Uh, and of course, it would have been much more convenient for me <laughs> if there had just been a straight direct flight from Baton Rouge to Columbia, right? It'd probably be convenient for you if there was a straight direct flight from Columbia to anywhere. No, <laughs> convenient for me if there was a straight flight from Baton Rouge to anywhere. Um, but of course, what at what cost would come those, you know, direct flights, right? So anytime we're weighing out, we're creating some kind of complex network we're weighing out between the integration and the segregation. So yes, we could have direct flights between every, um, between every airport in the country, right? But then that would come at a tremendous cost. So we're always kind of weighing out between the efficiency and the cost, um, so integration and segregation of a network. And so we can also conceive of the brain as a graph uh, and different parts of the brain as being um, as being nodes and then the connections, in this case, functional connections, because I'm dealing with the correlations, as, uh, as the edges. And again, we're always dealing with this integration versus segregation measure. And these are really two different ways of looking at the same network or different sets of measures that you can use looking at the same graph. Um, so we see here, these are two uh, identical graphs um, but in one, we're focusing on the hubs that are integrating. On the left, we're focusing on those blue hubs that are integrating the different pieces. And on the right, we're focusing on the modules or the extent to which the graph can be pulled apart into these um, subgraphs, which are more densely connected to each other than they are to other parts of the graph. So those would be modules. So I did a modularity analysis, analysis with these same data. Um, so modularity is basically a measure which can be derived from um, that equation and it allows, it gives us this modularity measure Q. And we can see these two graphs um, on the left and the right. They both have identical numbers of nodes, identical numbers of edges. They both have equal degree, so the numbers of average connections between uh, that each node has are equivalent. But you can see that the organization of them looks quite different. So on the left side, you see that there's a lot, uh, it looks kind of just more generally connected. Um, whereas on the right side, you can see there's a little bit more structure to it. And you can see some pieces kind of um, appear more separate. Um, and so the left side is actually, it's actually a random network. I just created a little toy network, told it how many edges and nodes, et cetera, to have. And you can see its modularity value Q is 0.27. Whereas on the right side, these are actually data from a social network, uh, the Karate Club, if anyone's familiar. Um, and uh, this has a higher modularity value, 0.41, because it has actual network structure. It's, whether it's a social or a biological network, it's common for there to be segregation um, and more modular kind of organization, which makes sense if you think of that um, if you think of the example of all the airlines, right? You can't have everything interconnected. It wouldn't be very a very um, good way of getting things done. And so in our case, the network nodes were um, parcellations, pars um, were brain regions from a parcellation, which included um, 463 nodes um, from the Connectome Mapping Toolkit. And so for each of those nodes, we were able to get uh, a time series, and then for any node that was included in a resting state network um, for, across all of the subjects, we were able to model that as a graph. And so the resting state 
networks then served as the communities. So when we saw that example of integ first integration versus segregation and the division into the modules or subgraphs earlier, um, those modules or subgraphs were created, as is usually the case, based on what's going to give you the highest modularity value. What are the se sections, the segments, the divisions of this graph that are going to make for modules that are the most interconnected to each other, right? Um, but in this case, rather than assigning the nodes membership in the community based on um, what's going to make the most modular, I assign them based on membership to a resting state network. And so when I looked at the modularity value um, from looking at as if all the resting state networks calling each of them a module and looking at the, uh, the that Q value, um, I found that consistent with the hypothesis that prompted this, uh, this uh, analysis, that as people's um, as people's brain organization became more modular, as we saw this segregation increasing, that we saw that same change in correct information units. So, yeah, right. Sorry, question. Mm -hmm. So, for, for this result, did you uh, look at the parts of the brain that were intact on everybody? Or, uh, how to say that? It just, uh, the thing is that, you know, like, uh, let's say that somebody had a really big lesion. Right. Somebody had a really small lesion, right? right. So, uh, uh, did you just look at the parts of the brain that were intact in both people? Yeah, so, oh yes, okay, so the question was whether um, I looked at the regions of the brain that were intact in all people or whether some of the nodes included in this um, were actually damaged. Um, and so no um, to the latter part and yes to the former part. So I looked only at, the, so a node was only included in this graph if it was um, present in that resting state for all people, so it couldn't be lesioned. Um, and so since the resting state networks are fundamentally, um, well, left lateralized in this population, but mostly bilateral, um, there were still a lot of nodes left, um, mm -hmm. some including some left hemisphere, but definitely dominated by the right hemisphere that was intact. Um, so, what we saw is that modularity, so this measure of uh, segregation, increased as people, uh, or an increase in that uh, segregation measure, increase in modularity, uh, so seemed to support an increase in the number of correct information units that people were able to uh, produce. And this was the case if we looked at pre versus post, also if we looked at immediately post. Um, however, the 12-week uh, um, was significant at a p-level of 0 0.05, but didn't survive the multiple comparisons correction, um, and we only had eight people left for that maintenance interval, and we did not see this pattern. Um, but at any rate, uh, it seems like, so this was the first analysis was data-driven entirely. This analysis was hypothesis-driven that if we could see more modularity among these resting state networks, we would see an improvement. When we assigned the, um, if we re assigned resting state community just based on the, um, based on the division that would make the graph, the brain model is graph most modular, we didn't see this same significant um, change. So it wasn't a change in overall brain modularity, it was a change specific to the resting state networks becoming more segregated. Um, so we believe this is confirmation of, to some extent of the the idea that functional segregation of these resting state networks of more independence supported this improvement that we saw in narrative production. Um, I think that it's quite possible that it might be associated with a more of a domain general cognitive benefit. It's not necessarily um, language based. Um, and, and then certainly this analysis looking at resting state networks is not specific to language. Um, but there are implications for targeting non-invasive brain stimulation. For example, if you're targeting multiple regions that you may want to consider, you know, trying to target within one resting state network or regions that are associated with one resting state network rather than, say, you know, across networks. Um, and then in terms of conclusions and projects that are ongoing, uh, I believe that, this, that these data suggest that we can uh, get some significant generalization with imitation therapy which is not necessarily intuitive, um, 
you know, because it's just repeating words and phrases, right? It doesn't necessarily seem like the kind of rich discourse that we want to encourage in our clients. Um, however, I would just add that imitation is a very fundamental part of actually providing therapy. It's written into a lot of um, a lot of other wise motivated uh, therapy programs where it's, you know, at least at some level of a queuing hierarchy in order to get um, results. Uh, it also seems like the segregation of these brain networks, these resting state networks, supports improved behavioral performance on these on this task, at least for these data. Uh, and I'm very excited to be here with others also who celebrate the fact that we have all of these advances that we can use in neuroimaging and statistics that offer us different ways of answering questions and even different questions that we're able to ask. Uh, and I believe that we may, and again, something this group is advancing a lot, um, that we may be able to use these neuroimaging uh, results as well as uh, genetic information, as well as you know, social and behavioral data in order to serve as biomarkers in the future, um, whether it's to predict how people are going to be able to uh, respond to therapies or even as a correlate of behavior. And current projects that I'm working on, um, I'm looking at the relationship between resting state and task-based networks in aphasia because, well, for one, it was something a reviewer pointed out. <laughs> um, but I'm, I am inferring that these changes in resting state network are related to the task, but I'm not actually measuring their performance during task. Um, and so that is kind of a jump. I expect that there would be uh, connection because there is a fun functional relationship, right? That's how these, that's what we believe that these networks are, right? That they have since the most basic tenant of right, neuroplasticity, that neurons who fire, that fire together, wire together, that that's what hap what's happened and that's why we see this basic fundamental network structure emerge in resting state. Um, but it still uh, remains to correlate it with uh, task-based uh, networks. Um, also working on TDCS um, with aphasia therapy and combining it to see if uh, we can get some a boost to our therapy outcomes. We're doing neuroimaging pre and post treatment, uh, so we'll be looking at some of these same kinds of measures. Uh, and of course, larger pools of participants, something else that is done very well in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, but looking at larger pools of participants um, is going to help validate all of these uh, kinds of studies, I hope or at least direct us better. Um, and that will also help in terms of moving towards personalized or precision medicine. And I'd just like to acknowledge folks who are very important, such as Steve Small, University of California, Irvine, and his funding from the IDCD, uh, also some other funding, um, my Board of Regents grant, which helps me to be able to continue to do work, some folks in the lab at LSU, and also some collaborators on Imitate. And of course, big thank you always to all of our participants. So without them, we wouldn't have any data. So, uh, and thank you all. So any questions, I'm happy to take. We have questions from the room first, and if you don't mind re repeating the questions from the online you mind, folks. If you're mind, okay. Yeah, and then, uh, and then we do the chat questions if there are any afterwards. Yes. So, two small questions. Right? The first one is, uh, how long was your resting state uh, uh, in, in fMRI? And second, uh, did you try to uh, change the size of the time window? And if you did, did it have an effect? Um, so the first question was um, how long the resting state was. And it was five minutes. Uh, but of course, some of the data was censored uh, due to motion. So sometimes it ended up being substantially shorter. Uh, we always had at least 55% of the data, but that's still um, not very long. Um, and then the question about the size of the sliding window. Uh, so I did do it with a shorter sliding window initially of 21 seconds and then uh, and had produced the same result and then actually read that 30 second windows were more stable. And so I, um, I increased it and was pleased to find that the results remained the same. Yeah. Uh, when you analyzed the uh, Cinderella story across time points, you did it at multiple time points, right, all across. Was it, um, did people have a tendency to kind of consistently improve, or was it very much so like an unreliable 
sampling every time. Obviously, there's, you know, we've done this task before. Mm -hmm. um, there's that aspect as well as just some other things that might contribute to performance on the day. Um, so the question was about the Cinderella task and yeah. them performing it multiple times. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the question of uh, just variability, basically, yeah. uh, which we know in folks with aphasia, that is such a hallmark, right? Not just from session to session, six weeks apart, but even with the same span of the same session, right? Um, and so we uh, did it four times. In each of those were six weeks apart. And um, we just looked at in terms of you know doing a pair t-test to see whether there were significant differences. And we didn't see significant differences at baseline. We didn't see significant differences in the maintenance interval. We only saw significant differences in the, um, during the therapy interval. Julius. Just a comment rather than a question. So uh, there's a new paper out by the Corbetta group. You maybe have seen it. If they're looking at spontaneous recovery and stroke in general. And what they show is very similar to what you show in that there's increased functional segregation associated with good recovery and stroke. Within a, I can't remember what the sample size is, but it's pretty big and it's very convincing. Uh, maybe you want to check it out. But it, it seems to be very much in accordance with what you find. So that was a comment from Julia saying um, that everyone should check out the Corbetta et al. recent paper um, that sort of uh, documents similar findings in a larger sample size, which is reassuring. And Dirk. Um, what can you tell us about um, uh, what we know about the correlation in uh, healthy unimpaired participants between functional segregation and cognitive function? Do we know anything about that? <laughs> yeah, so the question is what we know about um, healthy folks and how these, these segregation measures kind of play. Um, I don't know anyone who's done this particular analysis. Um, so I, did ha I didn't have um, data from healthy controls that was collected on the same scanner. I did have some data, data from healthy controls that was collected on another scanner that I did a similar analysis and found. So I should actually just mention this. Um, this so this state 10, the state of you know, much non-correlation um, was actually a state that people spent quite a bit of time in, like 30-ish percent of their time in. Um, and that was also something that I saw when I looked at the healthy controls that they spent a lot of time in this um, in this state. I mean, so of 10 states, you spend 30 percent of your time in one of them. Um, so that, I think, suggests that this might be a, a typical state. But also just in thinking about how these states are kind of determined in the first place, that it's, you know, an independent component analysis is saying, well, these, they're basically determined by the fact that they don't have very correlated time series, that they're more correlated within each other than they are, you know, across other voxels in the brain. Um, so I think that it would be uh, reasonably consistent, although I don't know for certain. Well, it would be interesting if it correlates with other, like, just general measures of verbal uh, Okay. Anything. Right. Attention. So the point is that it would be interesting if it correlates with uh, other measures in healthy controls that are you know, considered adaptive, yeah. like attention, working memory, et cetera. And that is an interesting question. I had another question that was sort of a follow-up to Bree's question, if I may. Um, <coughs> so, the four percent in the in the increase in CIUs. Can you tell us a little bit about what the what that looks like functionally? So, what's the functional impact of that? I mean, um, I haven't worked with CIUs, so is mm -hmm. that is that a real difference? Even if it's significant, I know that. But, yeah. yeah. So the question is, what what a four percent increase in CIUs looks like functionally? Um, I mean. I would say it's suboptimal in terms of what we're just generally trying to achieve in aphasia therapy. Um, you know, it tends to be uh, just because of the nature of the measure, it's weighted towards um, content words, of course. Um, so it doesn't tell us anything about grammaticality. Um, and uh, does it make a, a big difference in terms of how well they communicate their story? Probably not. Um, probably not enormous to the extent that it's really going to relieve that much of a burden. Um, but uh, 
I mean, I don't mean it to right. be a nasty question. Right. I just, I just, I'm, I'm just really curious. I just want to know like, what, <laughs> what does that really mean in real life for a narrative story? Right. Yeah, I mean, so it's four foot down, which is also, so it's 34-ish, mm -hmm. you know, so that's another, you know, that's another several sentences right. worth of um, material. Um, I don't know, and I'm not sure that, I don't, I don't know what a measure would be that would really capture <coughs> that, which I guess is something that we all struggle with if we're trying to do naturalistic analyses. We have a question on chat. Oh, question on chat. Oh, no. Can I just get rid of myself? Uh, that's a, that's a okay. Okay. Oh. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, did any of the participants have apraxia or? Oh, okay. Did any of the participants have apraxia or any other motor speech disorder? If so, did those patients improve to a greater degree? Uh, yes, some of the patients, did, participants, did have apraxia. Um, and no, we didn't see a correlation um, with improvement when we looked at you know, the results from the apraxia battery for adults, too. Any questions? Did you see any relationship between just the motion in the scanner and, uh, I don't know, performance or recovery? That's a good question. So the question is whether we saw a relationship between motion in the scanner and performance or recovery. Um, you know, I don't know. I didn't look at that. It's an interesting question. I might say that while I haven't actually looked at the data, um, that there might have been a correlation between motion and the lesion size. I don't know that that's actually true. I didn't do the, the, the numbers, but just in terms of thinking about what the data actually looked like and uh, you know who was excluded, that that might have been something which you know certainly might correlate to not necessarily the recovery because we didn't find that in terms of lesion size, but maybe in terms of like severity mm -hmm. overall. But that's an interesting question that we have. I think that wraps it up. Okay. Thank you Thanks. very much. Thank you very much.